Hello, everybody. Welcome back to East Brady Baptist Church for our worship stream for the week of January 10th, 2021. I am so glad that you join us for just this time where we pause to bring worship to our God. We bring this sacrifice of praise. Hey, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, won't you leave us a comment if you haven't already to let us know that you are, are joining us here and, and so that we can know how you are doing. We always love hearing from each other as, as we worship together online, and that's one way we can do that. I, I hope that you are doing well and that you are knowing and experiencing and understanding God's blessings in your life today. Let's begin our worship service this week with our call to worship, which this week is taken from Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, although we surrender our lives to you individually, we are called to live and serve in community as one body, even among this pandemic. Nevertheless, we do not see each other equally or accurately. We tend to think that some are more gifted, more attractive, even more godly than others. Rather than claim Christ's righteousness for all who believe, we judge one another, even ourselves, on worldly merit. Forgive us, Lord. Redeem us from our wrong thinking. Open our eyes to the truth of your perfect plan for your church body to work graciously as one. We pray this humbly in Christ's name. Amen. Well, uh, just a, a couple of announcements for you today. Hey, if you are watching this video as it goes out live on Facebook, not, not a little bit later, but if you're watching it as it goes out live Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., uh, hey, I want to remind you to join us uh, for our congregational meeting online at 11.30 today, just this morning, just a, a little while from now. So once this worship online worship service gets over uh, at 11.30, we'll meet together again online via Zoom for a congregational meeting. If you're a member, we ask that you uh, attend that meeting via Zoom. Uh, it's just important. We've got, we got some beginning of the year stuff we need to take care of and vote on as a congregation stuff we should have done back in January or, or November, uh, but because of the pandemic, it got pushed back. Uh, so that's today at 1130. If you want to join that meeting, you can find links for that on our website, www.eastbradybaptist.com and, and just look for uh, the link when you get there uh, that talks about information for our our online congregational meeting. Join us 11.30 a.m. this morning, just not even an hour from now. Second announcement is January 13th. That's this Wednesday. Uh, we are starting together a congregation-wide Bible reading plan for 100 days, and we're going to take a survey through the scripture of the highlights of scriptures uh, for 100 days. That starts this Wednesday, January 13th. Now, you can get a copy of that Bible reading plan, which tells you what to read each day in a couple of ways. It is posted on our Facebook group page, so you can go there and find it in the file section. Or uh, it is also on our church website, www.eastbradybaptist.com. You can go there, click on the link at the top that says Bible plan, and it will take you there, and you can see what, what you can read each day. Hey, and if neither of those work for you, hey, give me a call at the church office and we'll find a way to, to get it to you. But that starts this Wednesday. We wanted a few days there to give people a chance to get that and get ready for it. But this Wednesday, we start reading together. I'm excited about it. I hope you are too as we take this journey through God's Word together. Uh, that's all the announcements I have for today. So, so now we turn our attention to our prayers and our praises. As always online, uh, we ask if, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, if you've got a prayer request, if you've got something you're praising God for, go ahead and put it there in the comments and, and I'll see that and I'll be praying for you throughout the week and, and other people, you know, we come together here, you know, uh, we'll see it on our Facebook page and we will be praying for each other. So that's just a, a note to you if you're, if you're watching this on Facebook, hey, take a look at those prayer requests. Make sure you review the comments of this video after it's done to see how you you can be praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I will say as we enter this prayer time, it, you know, prayer is always, always important, always urgent. Uh, but this past week in our nation, we've had a lot of unrest, a lot of uncertainty, and, and some scary things for some people happening. And so I want to ask you to, to, beyond this time here, to continue praying for our nation, uh, not your own brand of what politically you think should happen, 
but just pray that God blesses us. Pray that God gives us wisdom and pray that God brings us his peace. And it starts only by us turning to him. So let us do that now in this hour. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today after, um, in some ways, a tumultuous week. It's, it's just the first couple weeks in January, God. First couple weeks of the year, we, we were all looking forward to 2021 just being so much greater than 2020. And, and already this year comes with its struggles. And we knew it would, God, because we live in a sinful world. The world just ravaged by sin, and so bad things are going to happen. We know that. And so we come before you, placing our trust in you. I know there are people out there who are praying with me, God, who this past week have experienced a lot of anxiety about things happening nationally, but maybe also just things happening in in their individual lives. And so we look to you as that one who gives us peace to bring it into us now. As we turn to you, God, just embrace us. Let us know the care and the certainty uh, of your, your arms around us. Uh, Let us know without doubt that you take care of us, you watch out for us, and that you will protect us, your children. But God, that that prayer of certainty also comes with with a a prayer of request that you embrace this nation, really the world, God. And we know you love us all. We know that you love this world. We know that you love the United States. But God, there there are some tumultuous things going on. And, And so we pray that you make us a wise, gentle people. And we pray that you do that by, by redeeming us in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you do it by bringing uh, revival to this land. Send your Holy Spirit into the hearts of those who would claim Christ, God, that we might be your agents of peace, we might be your agents of joy, we might be your agents uh, of wisdom, God, and, and speak your love and your peace into our situations. God, uh, by your Holy Spirit, help us to see how your will is being played out and and how we can join that. God, we've all got our own ideas about what should be going on, who should be doing what, who's right, who's wrong. And God, it's just so often, that's just not even helpful. Just help us to be peacemakers. Help us to see with your eyes. Help us to desire your will in this nation, God. Not our own political wills, but yours, God, and help us to, to join that and bring about peace. We, we pray for, for peace and wisdom among our lawmakers locally on, on up to nationally, God. Uh, what a tumultuous time for them. We, we pray you give them wisdom. Uh, and we pray that uh, they are your servants. And even those who would not seek to be your servant, we pray that you use them anyway to bring about your good purposes, God. Uh, but for it all, you know, we have a lot of nationalistic concerns going on right now. Above it all, God, help us to put you, uh, help us to seek your glory in it all, that you would uh, revive this nation for your name, that we would be a nation of people who uphold you and your will. God, in. We come, you know, and, and we make that prayer even amidst, you know, we're still in this pandemic, God. And people are still sick. People are still uh, dying and worried. So we pray again that you lift that from the world. You heal us, God. We pray that you give doctors and, and other healthcare professionals wisdom to help. We pray that the resources to help and heal people are there. We, we pray that those who have coronavirus, that, that God, you would heal them miraculously. And God, that... Um, uh, those who don't have it, that you would protect us from it. God, we, we pray uh, about this vaccine, that, that you would make it successful and speed it to its way uh, to, to the people all over the world in, in all places, God, as your way of healing us. But God, through it all, whether uh, there are difficult times or just uh, glad times when we say we're, we're getting to the other side of this, help us to remember that it's all about you and, and any freedom, any success we have, any glory that comes out of this is because of you and for you, God. Let us be your children who turn to you and trust in you. And God, even as we make that prayer, we make it regarding some situations that that we know about in our own lives and the lives of other people we know. And we pray for them right now, God. We we, we pray for for those who are uncertain that they would know your peace about things. We we pray for those who, who just need some extra help to get through. God, that you would provide it for them. We pray for those who are are sick beyond coronavirus, that you heal them, God, that you give them strength, that you help them to persevere through it. 
and that they see your hand through it. We pray for those who mourn, mourn the loss of a loved one, mourn the loss of a situation uh, that was dear to them. God, we, we pray your comfort upon them. We pray your presence, that they feel it, that they sense it, that they know that you were there with them, hugging them and walking through it with them, sometimes even carrying them through it, God. We, we pray that you help them uh, through, through the grief, see your purpose, see your plan, see your joy. God, we pray for your church in this world where, again, just this week, we've seen reports of, uh, of people who follow Jesus being persecuted for that. And we don't really understand what that means uh, right now in our lives, God. But there are people, brothers and sisters in Christ, who, who are, are in danger uh, just because they choose to worship you. And so we pray that you protect them. We pray that you keep them safe. We pray that you strengthen their faith, God. We pray that you help them to overcome again, for your glory, that those who are opposed to you and your word would have changed hearts. God, we pray for your church in the United States. Where we've drifted all this week. We've seen so many ways how, how people who, who claim the name of Christ just don't seem to understand the peace and love and agenda of Christ in this world. So we pray that you bring the church of Jesus Christ in the United States back to you. We pray that you open our eyes, each of us as individuals, to see how we have strayed ourselves. Stop looking at other people. Help us to see how we have strayed from you and what you would have us do, God, and by your spirit. Uh, we pray that, that, that you fix that in us. God, we, we pray that you strengthen East Brady Baptist Church, that you help us to love one another and to, and to serve one another. And God, that you would add to our numbers so that we can go out and be your vessels in this community. To, to spread your love to others beyond the church. Bless us, God, for it is the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, we come now to our, our, our time uh, of teaching and, and Scripture. As we turn to this time, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2 today from the scriptures. If you've got a book or an electronic device on which you use uh, to, to read your Bible, won't you open it to Matthew chapter 2? We're going to start at verse 13. Uh, and as usual, as we're live here, the words of the scriptures will be put up there on screen for you. Uh, but at Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 13, it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And now moving on to verse 19, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Well, for my first full-on sermon of 2021, I wanted to start up with something easy, kind of something simple, right, to just kind of ease us into the year. And so today, for my first sermon, we come and we talk about discovering God's will for our lives, which, you know, <laughs> is not an easy topic. But hey, it's the message that just seemed to be popping out of today's scripture lesson at me almost immediately when I read through it. So that's what we talk about today. Uh, and it's a topic, well, we need to discuss because there are some people who have followed Jesus for decades who are out there still asking, hey, how can I figure out what on earth God's will for my life is? Or what does God want me to do in my situation? Or, or where does God want me to go in this? Maybe you yourself uh, ask those questions. For most people, discerning God's will, it's not easy. Or at least we make it so that it's not easy. 
I think of the old joke, many of you have probably heard it, uh, of the man who's drowning and he prays to God. He says, God, please save me from drowning. So he makes that prayer and along comes a man in a boat and offers to, to, to pick him up and, and take him to safety in the boat. But the man who's drowning says, no, thank you. I prayed to God. God's going to save me. Well, some time passes and another boat comes along full of people. And all the people say to the man who's drowning, hey, let us bring you in or let us tow you behind us or, or something. And, and the man says, no, thank you. I've prayed to God to save me. So God's going to save me. Well, the man ends up dying, ends up drowning. He gets to heaven and he's talking to God and he says, God, I asked you to keep me from drowning. Why didn't you save me? At which point God just throws his hands up in the air and says, I sent you two boats, you big dummy. Oh, that's an old joke and not even a very great joke. Uh, and probably that's not the way God would respond really in that situation. But the story illustrates how even when it seems obvious, we can make discerning God's will more difficult than it needs to be. I mean, for the guy in the story, it was pretty obvious that it was God's will that he gets in the boat, but he didn't. You see, we make this harder than it needs to be sometimes. And I think that's why one pastor I found online this week said, of all the questions I am most often asked, I don't think I get asked any question more than, how can I find God's will for my life? And as your pastor, I have to say, hey, that's probably true. We get that question a lot, although it's not always in that form. People don't always say, hey, how can I find God's will for my life? But they'll say things like, what does God want me to do? What does God want me to do with my life? Where is God leading me? Which way am I supposed to go or which way am I supposed to pick? Hey, maybe even recently you yourself have been asking one of those questions or a question similar to that one, but just in a different form about your own life. We have that question. Hey, what's God's will for my life? Well, for a human example of how to figure out the answer to that, we need look no further than Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, hey, Christmas season is over, Pastor. We're done with all that Joseph stuff for a while, till, till next Christmas, right? I get it. I know Christmas is over. I need to do nothing more than look around our sanctuary. It's no longer decorated, right? But Joseph actually figures prominently in a couple scripture passages beyond what we normally look at at Christmas time. See, the indication is that Joseph died before most of what we read in the New Testament happens. But there are a couple of accounts from Jesus' early years in which Joseph is still around, including today's passage out of Matthew 2. So to get us caught up uh, on, on what we get in today's passage, I'll just say this. All that Christmas stuff has happened. The Magi have made their visit and they have left. And that is when God sent an angel to warn Joseph in a dream about Herod. You remember Herod the king? He doesn't want any upstart king of the Jews replacing him. Now, he doesn't know who that king might be, but he knows there's, there's this kid in Bethlehem, right? And he's going to try to kill Jesus. So God sends an angel to warn Joseph in a dream, instructing him to take Mary and Jesus and flee to Egypt because Herod's going to try to kill Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Some people read that, right? We read that and we think, gee, that's great for Joseph. I wish God would make things that obvious to me because, hey, an angel coming and telling you what to do, well, that seems to be pretty obvious as it is in this case, Right? And here's the thing, sometimes God's will is going to be blatantly obvious. It's going to be like he's screaming it at you. In those rare cases, do what Joseph did. Obey it to the fullest immediately. Obey fully immediately. See, you see, Matthew writes that Joseph took Mary and Jesus and fled in the middle of the night. See, he didn't even wait till morning. He just, he has this dream and wakes up and, and bam, they go. He, he, he obeys immediately. See, when God's will was obvious, Joseph didn't make discerning it more difficult than it had to be. He just obeyed immediately. And it's a good thing too, because we read Herod sent soldiers into Bethlehem to kill all the males who were two years old or less. He wanted Jesus dead. But because Joseph obeyed God immediately, Joseph and the family are spared. See, when God's will is obvious, don't wait. Obey immediately. First lesson. But as we're about to see, 
the, the path to following God's will isn't always so obvious, even when an angel tells you what to do. See, look at this with me. You see, we see Joseph and the family, they've fled to Egypt, and while they're there, some time passes. And we're not told how much time, but we know it's enough time for Herod's life to run its course. Herod dies, presumably sometime within Jesus' young life. And at that point, God sends another angel to Joseph in a dream to tell him, hey, take Mary and Jesus and return to the land of Israel. Go back to Israel. And there, you know, we read that, and we can think it again, gee, that's easy for Joseph, which God wouldn't make knowing his will that easy for me, but not so fast this time. Because Matthew makes sure we know that even though God has pointed Joseph in the right direction through this angelic visitor, there are still some things for him to figure out in order to pursue God's will. See, it seems Joseph is still having to ask questions about God's will and how his life intersects with that. What does God want me to do? Which way should I go? Because you see, God told Joseph through the angel to take the family to Israel. But Israel is this big, wide open place. And so Joseph's thoughts would have had to have been, okay, God, where? How? You see, for us as humans, discerning God's will isn't always easy. Even when God uses an angel or maybe some other means to point us in the right direction. But in this passage, Joseph finds the way. He finds his way into God's will. Joseph rightly discerns what God is doing. So let's, let's look at Joseph so we can learn from him how to do it. Because in Joseph discerning God's will for himself and his wife and the child, we see the three D's of pursuing God's will on display. And we're going to look at those today. Now, these three D's, it's, it's not an inclusive list of things that we have to do to align ourselves with God's will. It's not all inclusive. There's some things we might have to do beyond that. But hey, if we want to pursue God's will in our lives, these three D's represented by Joseph in today's passage, they are a good place to start. So, are are you ready for this? The three D's are pursuing God's will. Desire, data, and discernment. Desire, data, discernment. Let's look at these. So, when we talk about desire, we talk about uh, identifying our own desires, identifying our own feelings. We talk about having an emotional awareness. When faced with uh, a decision and, and desiring to act in accordance with God's will in that decision, We all have feelings regarding what's going on, don't we? We always have feelings about what's happening. Now, sometimes those feelings are God-directed. You see, God's Holy Spirit is working within you and causing you to to maybe feel uneasy about a situation, or maybe he's causing you to feel really excited uh, about a particular option. That's God's way of leading you in that direction. But hey, often, probably most of the time, Feelings, they're just based on our own reactions, our own responses to what we've learned from negative or positive things that have happened to us in the past. That's why you'll often hear counselors telling their clients uh, that feelings are not facts. You see, feelings are valid. Uh, They are certainly real to us and they're important to us, so they should be validated. But they're just these subjective things within us. They don't ever tell the whole story or even the true story. So we have to be aware of what our emotions are when we're discerning God's will. You know, in today's passage, did you catch it when I was reading it to you, that Matthew actually talks about Joseph's feelings? Yeah, we don't think of the Bible as often talking about uh, emotional things, right? We don't think of it being touchy-feely. But Matthew talks about Joseph's feelings as he was discerning God's will. We read that Joseph was afraid. You see, that's a feeling, fear. He's afraid because Herod's son is ruling in the region of Judea in Israel. It seems that Herod's son, Archelaus, took over ruling the the region uh, of uh, of Judea within Israel after Herod's death. Now, here's the thing. Bethlehem, as we know from the, the Christmas accounts, is the ancestral home of Joseph's family. Bethlehem is located in the region of Judea. Uh, So maybe Joseph's plan was to eventually return from Egypt to Bethlehem with Jesus and Mary, where he would have the support of his family. Oh, but now he finds 
that Archelaus is ruling there. And that makes Joseph afraid. See, he's got emotions. He, he, he's fearful. And fear is a powerful emotion, right? It can often lead us into disobeying God's will. See, perhaps Joseph was tempted because of his fear to just stay in Egypt, even when the angel told him clearly, go back to Israel. So Joseph, in order to, to find God's will for his life, had to be aware of his fear, had to be aware of his emotions, of his desires. So that instead of that emotion derailing him from God's will, he actually used it to discover God's will. See, aware of his emotions, he actually avoids Judea. And he ends up with his family instead in Nazareth in Galilee, a different region of Israel. So that Jesus will now be known as a Nazarene, which Matthew makes sure to point out to us is just as God had instructed his prophets to declare hundreds of years before. You see, Joseph, aware of his emotions, uses them so that he can go toward God's will. See, when pursuing God's will, we must be aware of our own desires and emotions and consider how they are affecting our view of what God's doing, where God is leading. So if you want to follow after God in your life, you have to learn to be honest with yourself about your emotions. You have to learn to step back and look at them. How am I feeling right now? Is this feeling a hint from God? Or is this feeling just my own desire? You know, Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 tells us, The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, when God is in it, there's a feeling of peace about it. There might still be other feelings, uncertainty or risk involved for you, but God's peace will also be there. That's why you have to be aware of what your emotional state is. This is the first D, desire. We speak about the second D, data. What we're talking about is actually gathering data. We're talking about gathering information on what your options are, where are they coming from, and what would they mean for your life and the lives of those around you? So you've got to do your research. You've got to look into it. You've got to get the data. A crazy thing happened to me this week. As I was going through the several-day process of writing this sermon, I had the outline done, knew where we were going, but I didn't have it completed, which is why I was able to just fit this story right in, right? As I completed the sermon, someone called me up as they were trying to pinpoint God's will for their life, and they wanted some data. See, they were faced with a decision and wanted to know the biblical and theological ramifications of what they were facing. So they called me up and they pretty much said, okay, pastor, give me some data about this. You're the guy who can give me the information. Now, now they didn't really say it like that, but that was pretty much the gist of what they were getting at. It happened right as I was preparing this message. See, when God gives Joseph the green light to go back to Israel, he doesn't just race back into Judea. No, Joseph looked in to what was going on in Israel. He got the data. And the indication is that he sought information, not for the purpose of potentially disobeying God and not going. That's not why he was getting the data. He was looking into it to consider the best way to follow what God had made known to him. He's like, I'm going to go do what God says. Now, what's the best way to do it? I imagine his thinking was something like, okay, I'm going back to Israel. There's no question about that. So what's the best way and what's the best place? I better look into this. See, sometimes, like in the case of Joseph, we may get a general direction from God on which way to go in life, but then there are questions after that, right? There are decisions and choices to be made how to get there or what's the best way to get there. And that's when we need to do our research. We need to consider the options. We need to get the data. You know, Jesus himself said, hey, when you're making important decisions in your life regarding God, this is what you do. And talking about making the decision to follow Jesus rather than ourselves, which is the biggest decision, it's the greatest will of God in our lives is that we follow Jesus. When talking about making that decision, Jesus tells this story. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 28, he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. You know what people are. See, Jesus is pretty much saying, before you make a big decision about your life and its direction, you need to get the data. 
Even if God has pointed you in a general direction, now you need to go get the information so you can follow his will the best way. What are your options? What will they cost you? Which is better for you? Which is better for those people around you? What would your first step be? What will some potential obstacles be? What skills do you have or are you lacking that would be needed to go down that path? Can you get or develop the skills that you don't have? How do you do that? You see, you need to get the data. But make sure you're getting the data for the right reason, right? You remember why you're getting the data. You aren't getting the data so that you can put together your own ideas, your own plan. No, you're getting the data to uncover the best way to obey God, to uncover and follow his plan. See, if we're not careful, getting the data can become a stumbling block to us actually living out God's will. Uh, it happened to the Israelites in the book of Numbers, particularly Numbers 13, but uh, you know, the, the account kind of goes across multiple chapters. You see, the Israelites, they had been led by God out of slavery in Egypt. And so God is now going to lead them, a nation of people, to settle in the promised land. A, man, a land that was good, right? See, that was God's ultimate will. They knew it. God had declared that to them. But before going into the land, they send a group of spies to scope the place out. You see, they send spies to get the data. So far, so good. Except when the spies return, they fill the people's heads with all sorts of terrors. Uh, they say, we, we can never take that land. The people live in there, they're, they're giants. I mean, we felt like we must be just little grasshoppers compared to them. And so the people, led by these data-gathering spies, decide to use the data to disobey God. And ultimately, they pay a heavy price for it. They end up wandering around the desert for 40 years. And they all die there in the desert. It's their children who ultimately inherit the promised land and get to settle in the promised land. See, we need to get the data. We need to look into it. Uh, you know, you get it, maybe talk to godly counselors, pastors, spiritual friends. Certainly praying is one way to get the data, to get the information straight from God. We need to get the data, but then we need to use it, not as an excuse to go the opposite way, but as a way of intentionally and intelligently following out God's will. Get the data. The second D. Third D. Final D discernment. It's time to discern. It's time to choose the option that increases faith, hope in your life and the lives of others. See, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, the, the pattern of this world is me, me, me. It's all about me. In this verse here, we're called out of that. We're told not to conform to that pattern. We are not to conform to that pattern of me, 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 even when we're discerning God's will for our own lives. And that catches us up sometimes because we're thinking about, hey, we're talking about my life. It has to be about me. See, that's the mistake we make that makes it harder than it needs to be. We're not talking about your life. We're talking about God's will and how you fit into it. See, it's God's will. It's all about God. That's why when Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, he didn't teach us to say, God, show me where you want me. No, he told us to pray, thy will be done. Your will be done, Father. Instead of thinking of me, 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 we are told to renew our minds with thoughts of Christ. You see, instead of going after the what's in it for me, we should be seeking to increase faith, hope, and love in whatever path we pursue. We pursue faith, hope, and love in our relationship with God and relationship with others. Faith, hope, and love. See, that's God's will. See? We say, God, where do you want me to be? Wherever I can increase uh, faith and spread hope and share love with others. That's the answer. 
Because where those things are, that's God's will. Because those things don't happen apart from God. You know, my parents own an old cemetery, and I'm not going to go into the details about how one comes to own an old cemetery, but they do, and to prove it, here are a couple pictures I've taken over the years. You know, when I'm, when I'm uh, doing yard work or stuff up in that area, sometimes I like to stop and look at the tombstones there, and I try to read them, and it's kind of hard now because they're so old and weathered and worn down. You can't really see a whole lot on a lot of them, but I do my best, and, and I like looking at the names. I like to see if there are any familiar names there, and, and surprisingly, a lot uh, of the family names on those tombstones aren't present in our area anymore. They used, used to be prevalent around here, but they're not anymore. So I look at the names, but I also look at the years. Because it's not what we do when we look at tombstones. Uh, we, we wanna, I, you know, when I'm looking at them, I look, want to see how old these tombstones are. You know, and, and, and most of these people have been dead over 100 years. But usually the dates are written on there. It's a birth year and a dash, right? And then the death year. Every once in a while you get a month and a day. But it's usually a birth year, dash, death year. The interesting thing to me is that most of us focus on the years and we just ignore the dash. But the dash, that's the most important part. Those are the years that were lived by that person. That one dash represents that individual's entire life, whether it was long or short, good or bad, glorious or shameful. We tend to focus on the dates, but the real story is in the dash. Right now, you are moving along that dash between your birth and your departure on this earth. The key question is, what does that dash represent? Does it represent God's will or yours? Jesus said he came to do one thing. He came to do his Father's will. We seek to do the same thing. You you want to enter into God's will. You want that dash to represent God's will in your life. Well, live a life of transformation and renewal for Jesus Christ. Look for the life that you live so that you can be transformed and renewed for Jesus. Live under the motivation of Christ's faith, Christ's hope, and Christ's love. Ultimately, that's it. When you do that, not only will your questions about life be answered, but you will abide within God's perfect will. Your life will be in God's will. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we confess that so much of our lives are lived looking out for ourselves, and looking out for what we want and we want to do, and self-focused God. And, and so at the start of the year, as we look at the life of Joseph, we, we, we desire to recommit to you our lives. We desire, God, to uh, seek out your will and then to come into it. God, forgive us for those times when we don't do that. We've got to open our eyes so that we can see what your will is. Help us uh, to, to be mindful uh, of how we are feeling and how that's in affecting things. Help us to be wise, to, to gather information around us and to see, it, to see it the way you would have us see it, God. And help us to choose. Help us to see which is the best way uh, to go and spread and be part of faith and hope and love that ultimately come from you, God. You know, we look to your word and it says uh, three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So God, help us to be those people of faith, hope, and above all, love in your name and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, just a brief word about tithes and offerings. As always, I tell you, if you just happen to have found us online, you're not a regular member or attender of East Brady Baptist Church. We're not asking anything from you here. This is a time uh, I'm talking directly to our, our regular members and attenders who have agreed to, to obey God and support his kingdom by supporting our ministry here at East Brady Baptist Church. You can do that by sending your tithes and offerings to East Brady Baptist Church at 508 Kelly's Way, East Brady, Pennsylvania, 16020. 
to eight. And keep in mind, as you are giving that, the monthly mission we are collecting for this month uh, is our own uh, deacons fund, which is our discretionary fund, which is the money we use to help people in our community when they need assistance. And uh, I told you last week, I'll tell you again, times being what they are, uh, that, that fund has been used prevalently. Uh, and just say, hey, this week, I, I just got a call from somebody uh, and was talking to them, somebody who we don't really know, but, but they are someone who had called us for assistance or contacted us for assistance previously, and we had helped them with that money in certain ways. And, and they just called, and it was great to talk to them about how, how they are pursuing God in their lives and, and how we were able to assist them in that. So, so the money is used for good purposes to help other people. So if when you're sending your tithe and offering, if you want a portion of what you were given to go to the deacon's fund, just please indicate that, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. But we're going to close here in a moment with the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, a fitting hymn to sing as we consider how to join in God's will in our lives. But just let me say goodbye to you by speaking a blessing over you today. May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.